two, one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, A World of Transformation, Moving from Degrees to Skills-Based Alternative Credentials. Bienvenidos a nuestro seminario, Un Mundo en Transformación, de las titulaciones tradicionales a las credenciales alternativas basadas en habilidades. Today's presentations will be held in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. You can listen on the original channel or in your preferred language. Just click on the interpretation icon below on your screen and choose the language you want. El webinar se desarrollará en español, inglés y portugués. Los invitamos a conectarse al idioma de preferencia, haciendo clic en el icono de su pantalla llamado Interpretación y elegir el canal que desee. As a part of the IDB project on education, today we are launching a report on alternative credentials, including certificates and certifications in collaboration with WorkCred. WorkCred is an American National Standards Institute affiliate non-for-profit corporation that focuses on improving the credentialing system and its standard. The objective of today's webinar is to share and discuss the findings of the report on the global trends about the transitions from degrees to skills-based alternative credentials and their implications in the region. We'll start the session with the work credits presentation. Then we'll move on to the discussion panel moderated by Mercedes Mateo, IDB Education Division Chief. Throughout the webinar, you will be able to send your questions in the Q&A tab next to the chat. To start this webinar, please let me welcome Isabel Cardenas Navia, who will share the summary of the report. Isabel serves as a worker senior director of the research to advance the research agenda and examine work, workforce credentialing issues and needs. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here this morning to share this amazing collaboration that we have been doing over the last several months. And so I'm really here today to talk about what is a profound change which is occurring in post-secondary education. And it's the rise of skills-based alternative credentials or non-degree credentials. And there's a variety of reasons um, and, and they have significant implications. And so those are, are detailed in the technical note. I wanna highlight a few this morning. So you know, why, what is driving this demand for alternative credentials? And I think that it really is this mismatch um, between the skills employers needs and what, what uh, skills individuals have. And that is in part due to you know, the, the fact that the jobs and occupations are changing quite quickly, in part driven by technological changes. And I think you know, re more recently accelerated by the pandemic. As we really all struggle to adapt, we've seen the, the job, the, the skills needed in jobs change quite rapidly. So we see this, this mismatch. And when you look at traditional degree programs, we see that this is a chart really showing that the area of study for degrees does not necessarily match the needed studied or skills for jobs. And so we begin to see that degrees are not uh, really meeting this, this uh, different, this, this gap between the skills individuals need for occupations and those they are educated in. And so as we begin to uh, look at how, you know, this, this has really given rise to address this mismatch of new types of education programs. And so here is a great example where employers, because they are the ones who are, you know, struggling to find the employees have entered the space to look at how they can provide these non-degree these alternative credentials to get individuals to meet their skills needs. And so this is a 
So you have many large employers who are now entering this, this, this space. And so this Go With Google is an example of a tech company, which is offering certificates in IT support, data analytics, project management, and other tech um, occupations. And the idea is that as they get, individuals can gain this, these certificates, and it will be, they will have the skills which are equivalent to a four-year degree and can enter occupations which, have, which require or need that type of educational background. And so you can see that Really, alternative credentials, this, this transformation of the shift to alternative credentials, it is so it can close the skills gap between the skills employers need and the skills that individuals have. And so they're really becoming crucial in this area. So I'm going to take a minute to look at, take a minute to go back and define what we mean by credentials. And so broadly speaking, when we talk about credentials, we're talking about all the different types of credentials from degrees to badges to certificates to certifi certifications to licenses. There's a lot of confusion sometimes about that language, but in it, what we really focus on for not these alternative credentials are certificates and certifications. And so you can have certificates where you're completing a course where it's really about you know, sitting in a classroom and learning things or maybe doing some activities. There are certificates of training completion. So this may be apprenticeships or other types of hands-on work-based learning. And there's certifications, which are assessments, third-party assessments that, that look at an individual's competencies to make sure that they have the competencies for a position. So this chart sort of details the differences between these different types of um, alternative credentials. But you can see that there's a variety of characteristics. And so this, this variety in the alternative credentials means that employers or individuals can select an uh, alternative credential which meets their particular needs. And that flexibility is really a key component of these types of alternative credentials. And along those lines, there are a number of um, characteristics which distinguish alternative credentials from degrees. And I'll say certainly being agile, being adaptive, and the ability to be open to new skills uh, are, are key, uh, key characteristics that, of alternative credentials. Because they are not you know, years long programs, they're able to adapt more quickly and meet the you know, change along with changing technological and skills needs of employers. On the other hand, we are also, they, they continue to maintain many of the uh, characteristics and benefits that degrees have. And so things like they continue to increase human capital, they are, I think, I would argue even better than degrees at communicating specific technical abilities and productivity. They are a way that employers can use to screen and filter employees. I think that's really important when you have hundreds of employees applying for a position, you need to be able to distinguish which ones have the skills. They are able to communicate um, dispositions. And I think you know certainly the last, and this is important to individuals as they select uh, a, an alternative credential, they still provide that signal to employers. Um, in addition, you know, in addition to the skills and learning an individual has, they're able to provide a signal to employers that an individual has the skills and competencies needed for an, a, a job role. And so we also, when you look at, you know, comparing and degrees, not credentials, we have here a number of differences between those two, but I'll, I'll really talk about the two right here, which is the duration of time to complete it and the cost to complete it. And so the duration of alternative credential is typically shorter than that for a degree program. Usually it is hours to weeks to months, some which require you know, many years of training can take years, but they can really meet an individual, uh, you know, they're, if they're where they, it helps an individual select something that is appropriate to where they are in their life and what their goals are and their own timeline. Of course, the cost is also a consideration. Certainly costs for degrees 
are quite expensive, um, many, many tens of thousands of dollars, whereas certificates and certifications uh, can range from very little money to, uh, you know, in the low thousands. So that piece, those two, the duration of time complete and the costs are significant differences when we look at alternative credentials and traditional degrees. And, you know, when you think about these structurally, you know, I, I think some of those um, differences become clear. So a degree program, whether it's associates, bachelors, masters, um, you know, or another postgraduate degree, uh, they are in structured blocks. There is a set of courses that need to be taken. This really contrasts with alternative credentials, where you can think about your professional goal and pick and choose different pieces, different education programs, different certificate programs, different certifications, which can build and signal that same skill, a skill set that is appropriate to a profession. And so it, again, this idea of flexibility, agility, and allowing an individual to you know, get specific skills that are needed for an occupation is something that is really uh, unique to alternative credentials. And so you know, when we think about, um, we really wanted to highlight the types of occupations that we are seeing this tremendous rise in alternative credentials. And you know, when you think about it, it has to be both the individual understands that the value of these alternative credentials and also that the employers accept and will hire based on these alternative credentials. And so we're really looking at, so, so we really see this trend in information and communication technology in the engineering fields, in construction, installation, repair, and transportation. And so that, that's, these are really spaces where you see an explosion of acceptance of non degree credentials. In more traditional fields like lawyers, doctors, and pharmacists, other professionals, there's still a desire to have traditional degree programs. And you know, I, I think I just want to say that both of these, you know, all of these types of credentials meet different needs. And I think that's the, that's one of the key pieces is that it doesn't have to be degrees. We're really looking at you know, what type of credential best meets the needs for an occupation, for an individual, for an employer. And so I'll spend just a couple couple minutes on the final slides here. And really, you know, this these, you know, what do we need to do? What is the what are the implications of these alternate credentials, and how do we take advantage of them? And I I would say this is really what work cred focuses on. You know, now it's not necessarily true that you need a degree to succeed in the labor market. There are, you know, multiple ways using these alternative credentials to signal your skills. There are still some, some key pieces which need to be developed, and I'll highlight a couple of them, for this to really meet its full potential. And so one is using a technology like blockchain or other way where employers can still understand that individuals have validated skills. With a degree program, the university provides a diploma and you can verify it that an individual has earned it and has those skill sets. Similarly with credentials, a technology like blockchain can verify that an individual has in fact earned a, a credential and, they, and, and that uh, pr provider of that credential verify that they have the skills that are associated with that certificate or certification. So that piece to build trust and the verification is an important piece as we think about continued expansion and use of alternative credentials. A second one, which is really, uh, you know, fo a focus of ours at WorkCred is this idea of an industry-wide standard criteria. Again, there has to be trust, you know, of what an alternative credential represents. When you say a degree, people understand what, what that signal, what does that mean? It means a series of courses, right? That there's a, a clear and common understanding of what a degree is. For, because of the wide variety of, non, of alternative credentials, there needs to be industry-wide standards for what these credentials mean. And that has that's related to quality as well as content. And so what what I would say is there, there is in fact a structure to develop these types of um, these this type of framework. So there are ISO standards for certification, which 
mean that if you have an accredited certification, it meets these quality standards and has gone through this quality process of development. And so similar types of um, standards can be developed for certificates. And so there's a clear and commonly understood concept of what these, uh, these types of alternative credentials mean, which builds trust and portability uh, for individuals and, and employers. And then, you know, I'll sort of end and say that, you know, alternative credentials, what we really, you know, what, what I really feel that there's a lot of value is that they allow an individual who may not have the time or the resources to seek a degree program to still meet their professional and personal goals. They allow employers to, you know, train their to, to give their employees an opportunity to move within jobs or across jobs um, with education and trusted credentials short of a degree program. And so it is both, you know, initial, I think initially many think of it as a short-term strategy to close the skills gap. We have, you know, this quick shift, let's get the people going. But I think it's also a permanent strategy of human capital development. You know, there, this, as we, I learn and uh, as, as employers buy into alternative credentials, as individuals have a better understanding of the value of credentials, it will become as clear a education pathway as degrees are right now. And you know, we while, while there is work to be done, we think there's a lot of potential and uh, a, a lot of promise in alternative credentials and that they're, they will only continue to grow in importance in the coming years. And with that, I'll just say really, again, appreciate the collaboration, have enjoyed this a lot and looking forward to the coming discussion. Thank you so much for nicely summarizing your, our findings, Isabel. Now to continue our conversations on these interesting topics, Mercedes will moderate the panel discussion, how are skills gaps filled by non-traditional actors? Mercedes, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, uh, Rhys. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you know, Rhys is also one of the authors of this report that we are launching today. And thank you also, Isabel, for the presentation of the report that, um, as, as she mentioned, is uh, a result of the collaboration between IDB and WorkCrate. Uh, hello to all of you who are connected, and thank you for following us online. Um, you can, as, uh, as you can see in the chat, you can download the report uh, using that link. And we look forward to hearing your comments and reactions through either this, this space, so this webinar, and also afterwards, let's continue the conversation on this important topic. And now uh, we will, we will uh, rapidly move into a discussion between experts of different reference institutions and organizations. Uh, and we will be discussing the importance of alternative credentials for the region, for the Latin American and Caribbean region, for their countries. And, and for that, we have identified panelists and actors that through their organizations are contributing to transform education and, and, and to develop talent in the 21st century. Uh, let me very quickly do a quick round of, of introductions. First, um, from the OECD, we have Glenda Quintini, Senior Economist, Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs uh, Directorate at the OECD. We also have uh, Maria Sp Spice, co-founder and co-CEO of Holon IQ. Uh, we have Amanda Brophy, Director uh, at Grow uh, with Google, uh, from, from Google. We also have Jose Camilla, Associate Director uh, at the Institute for the Future of Education at the Tecnológico de Monterrey. We have also with us uh, Mariana Costa Checa, uh, co-founder and CEO of Laboratoria. And la last but not least, we have Nicole Amaral uh, from the Skills Transformation. She's a Skills Transformation Lead uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean at Coursera. Welcome, Glenda, Maria, Amanda, Jose, Mariana, and Nicole. Thank you so very much for, for joining us in this, uh, in this conversation and for being here with us today. 
Uh, we are going now to be reflecting together about the initial questions that Rhys mentioned and, and Isabel. Um, will alternative credentials replace traditional degrees? What is the driving demand for non-degree and alternative credentials? How are the two systems uh, coexisting? What is the tension uh, behind those, those two, those two uh, models of, of uh, working and developing talent? And what are the occupations that are more open to these alternative credentials? Uh, but before moving into uh, the first question, I have one more request for all of you who are following us online. Please do not forget to send your questions through the Q&A uh, tab and also download the, the report. We will start with Amanda Brophy. Uh, as I mentioned, Amanda leads Google skilling work, uh, including the Google Career Certificates Program, and uh, that, that provides people access to in-demand, high-paying jobs, regardless of educational background or work experience. And under her leadership, these certificates have provided significant upward mobility to 70,000 70, job seekers. Uh, Amanda, from our study, we learned that Google would treat Google career certificates as the equivalent of a four-year degree for related roles in their hiring. And we also know that Google has an employer consortium that hire Google career certificates. Uh, so the question is, do Google career certificates really, really honestly, do, do Google career certificates really work? What are the impacts so far? How has Google been hiring career certificate uh, graduates? Uh, thanks so much, Mercedes. Um, and everyone, nice to meet you. Amanda Brophy uh, from Google. Um, you know, exactly as Isabel's presentation was, which is we really saw at Google a mismatch between what employers were looking for and what do we think about what job seekers had and the skills they needed and how could we help bridge that gap? And so at Grow with Google, which is Google's commitment to economic opportunity, we're constantly thinking about how can we make sure to help create a more equitable and inclusive job market. One of the things that we saw are these Google career certificates, which help get you, um, jobs in entry level roles in fields like IT support, project management, data analytics, user experience design, digital marketing, fields that are high growth and high paying that don't necessarily require a college degree. And we realize that you're able to teach all of the concepts, have hands on learning, and we're able to teach it all with um, Google experts that help create it with decades of experience. But you know, no one gets trained just to get trained. You get trained to have a better outcome, better career, um, make a little bit more money, have healthcare benefits, et cetera. And so, um, as Mercedes said, we have 70,000 graduates from this program, 75% with a positive career impact, uh, job, raise, promo. And what we did is we built an ecosystem around it. So we built an employer network of 150 employers, companies like um, Walmart, Best Buy, Deloitte, Accenture, as well as Google that will hire these graduates. In the United States, we're in community colleges across the nation. We're working with four-year universities to help bridge the gap and really think of these short-term credentials as a um, and, not an or. And so this is either to help those without college degrees, but also can help bridge the gap between education and employment. And for us, that's been one of the most important ways. And yes, I do think they work. Um, we hire these folks at Google um, as well as in our employer network. Oh, thank you so much, Amanda. And uh, I, I get this. Uh, I, I, I want to emphasize this idea about the ecosystem. How do you just uh, don't work uh, alone uh, in these in these alternative um, credentials or with your uh, graduates, but you work uh, with with other companies, as you mentioned, uh, to to actually make this uh, this uh, training uh, useful or or kind of uh, transferable from Google to to other other other. Uh, companies. Uh, I just have very quickly a follow-up question on that, Amanda. Um, you mentioned that you have uh, 75, you've seen in your graduate 75 positive career outcomes and, and related to this idea of ecosystem. Are you seeing exactly the same things uh, on your on, on your own, so on Google, within Google, uh, as, as you are seeing with, for example, Walmart? So are the results uh, equally 
uh, successful in both for, for those graduates, regardless of the company they go into, provided, of course, I understand that they are part of this ecosystem that you've been working with? Yeah, so I think there's two ways to think about it. The first one is actually the way we created these Google career certificates is it was actually an internal pilot at Google, which is we thought about, could we help create more diverse talent? And that actually meant for us, not a four-year degree. And so we actually built curriculum and IT support, you know, for those that are fixing your computer when it breaks, especially on a Zoom, thinking about how to like rebuild things, things like that. We found it was so successful to, to build the curriculum that we kind of did what is in Google's DNA is we made it available for everyone to access. We put it on Coursera, um, who's our distribution partner. And, and when we saw it was so successful, that was how we were able to get this kind of employer consortium piece. I think what um, is interesting as you think about like, you know, a Walmart versus a Google and things like that, is actually what we found is that 55% of our graduates are uh, Black, Latino, or Asian, and a little under 40% come from the lowest income strata, so making under 30K a year. Um, and so one of the things that we've really seen is this is a really great way to bring in diverse and um, kind of a new pipeline to various employers, which I think is what makes this so appealing. That's great. Thank you. Thank you also for emphasizing this idea of uh, how diverse of a population that you are, I mean, this talent that you are tapping into, uh, untapped talent, actually, we could we could call it because it's um, it's clearly providing opportunities to these and uh, these different people with different backgrounds. I think it's it's great and it's a, um, actually a, a great contribution to closing the skills gap. Uh, so so thank you thank you for sharing that um, Amanda and now uh, we I would like to turn into Amanda actually mentioned their partnership with Coursera I would like to turn to uh, Nicole hello Nicole how are you welcome thank you so very briefly Nicole at Coursera advises academic institutions businesses and governments on skill development strategies and solutions aligned with the future of work um, Nicole, I have a question for you. Um, we know that uh, various content providers are providing the learning content through Coursera, which is, uh, I mean, Google just mentioned one, one example. We also know that uh, you offer uh, certificates, micro-credential, online degrees, so a variety of, of products. On Coursera, some universities have uh, launched online degree programs that offer the same degrees at, or similar degrees at a fraction of the traditional cost. And uh, just to give uh, the audience an idea, Coursera's master track certificates cost around uh, $2,500 or to $2,500 uh, approximately. So uh, how have been Coursera certificates, macro credentials, online degrees accepted in the market? Why do you think it's so either in positive or negative? And does it change the traditional education markets? Yeah, well, let me start um, by first saying thank you for having me on this fantastic panel. It's an honor to be here and congratulations on the launch of a very timely and relevant publication. So. Um, let me start by kind of more directly answering your first question. Um, I think they've been well received. We've seen interest on both the part of students, universities, um, and industry partners in bringing alternatives to the post-secondary education market. Some of those are industry partners like Google that's here today, and Tech de Monterrey that's also here as well. Um, and so among our professional certificates, for example, we have over 2.1 million enrollments in the entry-level certificates, and we've seen 141% um, growth year on year on those in enrollment in those certificates. And with our degree programs, which I mean, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, we have over 16,400 um, degree students enrolled as of March of this year, and we are seeing 22% growth in enrollment in those year over year. Um, and nine of those degrees are now um, offered by university partners in Latin America, um, and six were launched just, just this year. Um, but I think it's, it's really interesting that you highlight cost um, and, and you think you're zeroing in on one of the more important aspects of the suite of credentials that we have launched on Coursera and that's accessibility. Um, and cost is one of those aspects of accessibility that we're seeking to address. Um, I think you're seeing increasing pressure on traditional degree pathways and the institutions that offer them to innovate um, and to justify both cost uh, and relevance. Um, so what I do wanna emphasize though, is that um, what I think we're seeing people 
look for is more flexible and affordable options and alternatives, as was mentioned in the, in the uh, opening pr uh, presentation. But we don't see degrees um, as an either or scenario. So some people say everyone needs degree. That's obviously not true. Others say no one needs a degree, and that's definitely not true. Um, and what we know is that post-secondary education across the globe does increase employment rates, job security, lifetime earnings. And this is true in Latin America as well, right? We see college degrees in Mexico, for example, have a 78% earnings premium over high school degree. Um, so it's one of the highest among OECD uh, countries. So where I think we're trying to focus is on making degrees more accessible, bringing them online so that people can complete them more flexibly um, and on their own schedules and in different geographic locations and at being at a lower cost is part of that equation. But there's another aspect to that, and that is making permeable degree pathways that are more accessible and stackable and job relevant. Um, and stackability is one of the things and unique aspects of Coursera's learning ecosystem that we're working towards. And I'll give you, you know, two examples of that. Um, first, we've seen that 50% of those who do end up enrolling in a degree program on Coursera started by taking an open online course. So even the original MOOC uh, format can be a door opener into a degree. Um, and in the US, for example, we've pursued um, credit recommendation from the American Council on Education um, to get equivalencies, which means it, it's easier for higher education institutions to understand the quality um, and the content and offer credit for these certificates as well, including some of the ones from Google, but also from IDM, IBM and, and Meta. So it removes some of those barriers to cost, time, and credit uh, hours so that you can pursue with some of these certificates also an associate or bachelor's degree. And universities like the University of North Texas, Northeastern, they're already awarding the equivalent of up to four um, courses of credit in these areas. And I think what's really exciting in the region in Latin America is that we're also seeing a number of universities uh, across Latin America use Coursera content and professional certificates like the Universidad um, Uniminuto and the Universidad Peruana de Ciencias Aplicadas, Universidad de Guadalajara, where we're working them to actually rethink curricula and think how we build these professional certificates or other types of skill-focused learning that's offered on Coursera into their curricula for academic credit in a wide variety of, kind of modalities so that students graduate with their degree, but they also can graduate with professional credentials and benefit from multiple signals to the labor market. Thank you so much, Nicola. And I want to just uh, emphasize a few things. Uh, one is 22% uh, growth in enrollment. Wow, that's that's impressive. Um, uh, the other thing is that, as Amanda mentioned, you also emphasize a lot the role of partners. And at the end of the day, you are talking a lot about the ecosystem. So the importance of having an ecosystem um, in in the in the in the different in the different sides of of the key actors that are involved in the process of training and recruiting uh, people and talent. So I, I like that idea too. That is a constant through the two presentations or the two the two um, interventions. Um, also, I think it's uh it's the point that you highlight about access, increasing access. How we can increase access, particularly in a region in which one out of two students don't complete secondary education. We need to raise that, those numbers, but also to those that complete secondary education that they continue with sec post-secondary education programs so that they are up to speed for the demands of, of a market that is transforming in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. So I like, I like those ideas on how you capture and, and emphasize just as Isabel and, and Amanda, the ideas of flexibility, affordability, and 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 so on uh, and and the fact also that we are not this is not a dichotomous world it's not like either degrees or or certificates but it's like a continuum and and I also like very much the idea of the stackability of the stackability of everything degrees with with certificates uh, certificates with degrees eventually and that idea of a continuum we really need to help individuals to build that continue because we will have to reinvent ourselves and transform and move from from different occupations in a world that is producing different jobs and, and inventing producing new jobs uh, by by the minute so I, I I like that idea as well I, I still have a question uh, that uh, I see that there is an increase in demand you mentioned that number 23 percent growth in involvement I still see that there might be a challenge in how those 
th this training translates into more jobs and in, in, into employability, basically, and, and not just accessing to jobs, but accessing to quality jobs. And I think there we might have still a little bit of a challenge and 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 the other the other issue that uh, we discussed before with uh, with Amanda is about transferability. Maybe when you get it, you get a certificate from a company that is custom made to that specific company. But how does it help you to eventually move from that company to another company? So I see those as 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 to um, as to important challenges. Uh, but thank you, Nicole, for those uh, reflections. Extremely, extremely useful. And now we're going to move uh, in, uh, to, to uh, Mariana, Mariana Laboratoria. Uh, as you know, um, I, I'm going to switch to Spanish very quickly here. Es uno de los programas de codificación, coding bootcamp, que son pioneros en, en la región. Eh, Mariana, bienvenida. Eh, es la cofundadora, como muchos de ustedes saben, eh, y directora general de Laboratoria, una organización que empodera a las mujeres que sueñan con, con un futuro mejor para que inicien y desarrollen eh, carreras en, en tecnología. Um, Mariana, eh, ¿inglés o español? I think we can go in English. Let's do it. Let's do it in English then. So uh, from our report, we know that some of the people that graduate from coding boot camps can make as much as someone with a university degree in computer science. Uh, what is important here is that a coding boot camps, a boot camp, and we've been discussing the issue of affordability with Nicole, cost in terms of time and money a fraction of a university degree. And I think that is key in the in this equation. Based on your experience in Laboratoria, is that really true? Can a student uh, that graduates from Laboratoria make as much money as a student that graduated from a traditional computer science, science university degree? Is there a myth involved? Uh, is this wishful thinking? Is this really true? Uh, what do you think, Mariana? Yeah, thanks, Mercedes, and thank you for the invitation. Really interesting conversation. Um, so the first thing I would say um, it's that it it's really um, important to to see coding boot camps not necessarily again as a replacement for traditional degrees. Um, so when we talk about, for example, who are our students at Laboratoria, the average age of our students is 28 years old. So we are not talking about an 18 year old that just finished high school and it's looking for an alternative uh, because she might not be able to afford higher education, for example. We do have some cases of younger students, but really the core of our students are in their late 20s, early 30s. And they're women that um, either already went through some sort of higher education experience that did not end up translating into better job opportunities um, or had, could start higher education, but life came in the way and they weren't able to finish. So they are already in their late 20s, often either outside of the workforce or just uh, doing uh, non-skilled, low-paid jobs. And, and I think that most students that pursue a full-time immersive bootcamp that has an expectation of job placement are probably students uh, that are either in, in this stage that I'm describing from our students or that want a career change and want a full rescaling path to start a new career in the world of software. Um, so, so I think that's, that's something important to signal. The second thing is that also not all bootcamps are created equal. And this is something that, that I talk a lot about because we need to be very careful. Uh, first, the world bootcamp it's pretty, it's pretty big. So it depends why, what do we understand by bootcamp? But when we talk about programs that, that have the outcome of placing people in the job market in the short run, say in, in under a year, you know, in any time, anywhere between six months uh, uh, and a year, then, um, then I think we should uh, make our programs accountable to those results if we don't want to follow the same path that has happened with many higher education institutions. So if you see, for example, higher education in Latin America, enrollment has increased dramatically over the past two decades. But unfortunately, the returns of that higher education haven't necessarily followed the same, the same track, precisely because they've been a number of 
eh, lower quality, less pertinent, higher education alternatives out there. Eh, in, in my country, in Peru, this has been, I, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to talk about it because it, it, in the end, eh, so many young people get trapped, you know, in, in investing the, the limited resources that they have in pursuing a degree just because the, the idea of having a degree is so valuable. And then after four or five years of studying, they have a degree that has absolutely no relevance in the market. So with Cody Bootcamps, I think we, we need to make sure that we don't follow that same path and that we, we, stay, we keep up to our promise of placement. Um, and that is not, it, I think it's easier said than done. It's actually pretty challenging to, to get someone uh, job ready in, in as little time as six months, in particular, uh, someone that maybe hasn't worked before, that this is going to be their first time holding a, um, a full-time job in the formal economy. Uh, it's obviously doable, and that's what we've been uh, trying to figure out over the past few years and, and many other organizations in this space. But it's not a, like a, how do you say this? Una varita magica, you know, like a, 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 a magic trick that you can do. I magic know, wand. Know, yeah, yeah, we're placing thousands of women every year. It's it's actually really hard. And, and when you look at the design of boot camps that are truly focused on outcomes and that achieve significant valuable placement results in quality jobs, they're pretty intense. In our case, we have over 8,000 applicants a year, a really thorough admissions process to try and identify potential in women that don't have the experience, but we need to dig deeper to see who of them actually have the, the best opportunity of making the most out of the program. Um, not everybody is there uh, due to several different contexts and backgrounds uh, and the challenges of being job ready in six months. So that's the first part. Then the program, uh, it's over a thousand hours of learning. Uh, there is, uh, it's, it's done, hand in hand with companies. There is a lot of life skills involved, you know, of empowerment, of believing in yourself, of learning how to learn. Um, so it's it's not, we actually don't have classes, for example, because we've realized that in the world of software, if we want our students to succeed, they need to become independent learners and owners of their own learning journey and path. The placement effort for someone that hasn't had a job before or a, for, a job in the formal economy, it's also pretty significant. It's well worth it because we do see that once they get their first job, then they, they're ready to fly and they don't, no longer need us, need us or anyone for their second or third job. And the payoff, it's a lifetime payoff because we're getting women that now will, will be for life able to grow in their careers. But you need to put a lot of effort in building all the holistic skills that you need to actually go out and be competitive in the job market. Um, so, so it's not as, 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 sometimes it sounds easier and, and we always see there's a number of programs, you know, yeah, we want to train thousands of developers and get them placed. And I, I'm always a little bit cautious um, because, because we leave it firsthand and, and, and it's hard. In, in our case, we are a placement program. That's, that's our core focus in the bootcamp. Last year, we placed 88% of our graduates with salaries that are competitive with university salaries. Our average exit salary was uh, over $1,100 in Latin America. That's, that's pretty competitive. It's more or less the same that you get out of a degree in a good school. Um, it's a drastic change from what our students were earning before, which was around three hundred dollars. Most of them were actually not making, not having any income. Um, so it's significant. But we trained six hundred women, and and this is our struggle. I always try to say six hundred. It's great, but it's not enough. No, how can we push that to hopefully six thousand? And I think this is the trade-off between in-depth programs um, that have that outcome in the short run versus programs that uh, maybe maybe get to that same outcome, but in the longer run. And I think it's important to have a combination of both things, no? Uh, coming back to what, what both Amanda and Nicole were mentioning, uh, it's really about an ecosystem. A bootcamp is not for everyone. Um, and there needs to be a diversity of options to get to that same outcome. Now we, for example, are launching a new program because we precisely realized that full-time six months is, is not a possibility for many women. It's just not because there's other responsibilities. Um, 
being job ready in six months is not for everyone. Some people need longer time, you know, to mature other aspects. Um, so, so we want to have in parallel the, the immersive option, but also alternatives around certificates where you start stacking uh, skills and maybe you won't get there in six months, but after two years, you'll get there. Uh, and that's also incredibly valuable. Thank you, Mariana. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really, it really struck me the fact that, um, well, I, the kind of the, um, the, the population that you attract, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because you were talking about uh, late twenties, early thirties. That's, that's an interesting uh, age range, and, and also people that are eventually unemployed or in, in, in jobs that are low skill, low pay, and they are looking for a change in career. That's that's something something interesting. The other the other thing that really um, caught my attention is the fact that your emphasis on both quality of the programs and relevance, but also on the selection process that accompanies that. So uh, a higher quality supply, but also a higher a more selective process to uh, to identify the right the right students and this is something that I'm sure most of most of us think of uh, not necessarily at, uh, linked to boot camps or these alternative credentials but more linked to the traditional university degrees and I think that's something something really important to, to, to put on the table the fact that also these type of alternative programs or these credentials are becoming more selective when they identify uh, potential students. And so that's that's another another important thing. The other issue uh, I, uh, that, that, that I think it's a key issue uh, for any type of program, public sector, private sector, is the issue of scale. How do you take these programs that you mentioned to scale? How do you move from 600 to 6,000 and eventually more? Because the amount of, of, of talent that we need to that we need to train uh, uh, and develop in in this context today is is huge. So, thank you for thank you for that, Mariana. Very very um, interesting uh, your 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 points. And now we're going to move to um, Jose Escamilla, el director del Instituto, como como mencioné, para el futuro de la educación del Tecnológico de Monterrey, como todos ustedes saben, el propósito del instituto es generar, transferir, difundir conocimiento aplicable sobre innovación educativa, conectar, inspirar y acompañar a aquellos que están buscando soluciones disruptivas para el futuro de la educación superior y el aprendizaje para la vida. Bienvenido, José. Un gusto sí. tenerte aquí. Encantado de estar aquí. Gracias, Mercedes. Gracias, José. Eh, <risa> De nuestro informe eh, salen algunas conclusiones, hemos estado viendo, nos las ha presentado Isabel, que las instituciones de educación superior han transformado también, han adaptado su oferta para responder a esas demandas del mercado, eh, de los estudiantes, de los jóvenes, del talento eh, disponible y, y, y además también para, para, para de alguna manera responder a esos interrogantes que hay hoy sobre las titulaciones académicas tradicionales en términos de costo, tiempo y calidad. Eh, el TEC es justamente uno de esos ejemplos de institución tradicional, pero, pero que ha sido capaz de innovar eh, en educación superior. Es uno de los referentes, de hecho, en innovación en educación superior. Y siendo, un referente, siendo vosotros un referente educativo en la región, ¿qué habéis hecho para que vuestra oferta sea relevante, sea accesible? Eh, ¿Y cómo, cómo veis este tema de el potencial, la potencial disminución de valor de títulos y la creciente necesidad de mayor aprendizaje adaptado a las trayectorias educativas y laborales de cada, de cada estudiante? Un poco en esa línea de lo que conversábamos con, eh, con Amanda, con Nicole, eh, de, de, la, de, de la stackability de, de los diferentes, de los diferentes eh, certificados, títulos, etcétera, que uno va adquiriendo a lo largo del año. Sí, gracias por, por las preguntas. Quiero comenzar por, um, por esta segunda parte de lo que hablabas ahora, que creo que en el chat pusieron una pregunta si los títulos universitarios van a volverse irrelevantes, ¿no? Y me parece que me, a mí me podría tocar contestar esa pregunta porque soy el único representante de, de, una, de una universidad. Yo creo que vamos hacia un mundo donde vamos a convivir con programas eh, universitarios y programas más cortos orientados al desarrollo de competencias 
o credenciales eh, y que el estudiante al salir del bachillerato va a enfrentarse a esas dos opciones. Una opción de más corto plazo en donde se va a formar rápidamente para el trabajo y una opción de más largo plazo en donde va a formarse a través de una universidad. ¿Cuál sería la diferencia entre esas dos formaciones? En mi opinión, las personas que se formen en la universidad, el programa universitario tendría que darles a ellos un bagaje inicial, unas habilidades para que en el futuro, cuando se tengan que reinventar, sea más fácil que se reinventen, ¿no? Por estas habilidades que generalmente llamamos habilidades suaves, como aprender a aprender, la colaboración, y a mí me gusta llamarle en inglés power skills, como habilidades clave, ¿no? Que son tan importantes. Y las personas que se vayan por una formación más corta, probablemente les vaya a tomar un poco más de tiempo eh, reinventarse, ¿no? Esa, es, esa sería mi, mi especulación sobre el futuro. Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué significa esto para las universidades? Significa que ese mercado de las credenciales alternativas, pues básicamente lo están ocupando startups, empresas, ¿no? Como Laboratoria, Google, eh, que están aquí. Y que las universidades, eh, en mi opinión, tenemos que eh, meternos en ese mercado, tenemos que estar ahí y tenemos que tratar a esta formación a lo largo de la vida al mismo nivel que el título universitario. Normalmente lo vemos como de segunda clase o una manera de obtener recursos para otras actividades de extensión, becas, etcétera, de la universidad o investigación. Y ya no debe ser así, debe ser algo que veamos como parte integral. A mí me gusta la idea del currículum de 60 años, es decir, que la universidad piensa que un estudiante que llega a la universidad no se queda solamente cuatro años con nosotros, sino que cómo nos podemos volver en el socio formador de la universidad, del estudiante, perdón, para el resto de su vida, ¿no? Por eso de, de, 60, de 60 años. Y bien, ahora pasando al tema de qué es lo que hemos hecho en el TEC de Monterrey, no tenemos varios años alrededor del tema de credenciales alternativas. De hecho, en el 2019 sacamos un reporte del Observatorio del Instituto del Futuro de la Educación alrededor de este tema y eso pues permitió pues, comentar esto con la comunidad, pero también internamente dentro del TEC. En particular dentro del TEC hemos hecho varios experimentos, pilotos, eh, sobre todo en el posgrado, eh, que nos han permitido eh, entender, hacer investigación y validar el interés y la, y, la, eh, y la factibilidad, digamos, de estos programas cortos. Eh, hace un par de meses, después de este espacio de experimentación, lanzamos una normatividad interna que ahora eh, define eh, dentro del TEC de Monterrey qué son las credenciales alternativas, eh, tanto para el pregrado como para el posgrado. Y eh, en realidad, las, y, y para los programas de formación a lo largo de la vida. Una credencial alternativa, entonces, es eh, una, una experiencia de aprendizaje que responde a una necesidad del mercado laboral, de la industria, de los negocios, pero también eh, de las necesidades de la sociedad eh, o de necesidades personales o culturales. ¿no? Y esas eh, eh, credenciales alternativas son títulos que pueden ser totalmente independientes de un grado académico formal, de pregrado o posgrado, o pueden ser eh, complementarios o acumulables. Eh, como hablábamos de stackability hace un momento en inglés, pues a eso me refiero, hacia un grado. Eh, están muy conectadas con las necesidades de la, de la industria y de la sociedad, como lo comentaba, y se pueden ofrecer en cualquier, en cualquier modalidad. Nosotros hemos hecho la diferencia en, en dos tipos de programas, microcredenciales, eh, que son hasta de 95 horas, y macrocredenciales que van de 96 a 700 horas. Todas las microcredenciales que ofrecemos dentro del TEC eh, otorgan insignias eh, digitales y al día, al día de hoy hemos hecho ya, pues, como decía, pilotos en, en pregrado y en posgrado. Y en posgrado tenemos eh, en particular programas eh, que en nuestras propias plataformas hay alrededor de 25 programas eh, de, del área de educación continua que están en proceso o ya están listos para ofrecerse como programas de credenciales alternativas con esta mirada de la que acabo de hablar, que permiten algunos eh, stackability hacia algún programa de posgrado. Y también hemos hecho lo mismo en, um, en, eh, en el bachillerato. Hacia el futuro vamos caminando en el bachillerato también, en, eh, en poder enriquecer eh, todo lo que hacemos con los estudiantes, que puedan obtener estas credenciales alternativas a lo largo de su grado, a lo largo de su grado, de su pregrado, perdón. Eh, eso nos permite, lo podemos hacer porque nuestro programa educativo modelo educativo TEC 21, que está basado en competencias y en retos, en donde los estudiantes trabajan en retos de la industria, los negocios, gobierno, organizaciones de la sociedad civil, 
es relativamente fácil eh, tener esta práctica que se requiere para poder otorgar estas credenciales alternativas representadas también con una insignia digital en el blockchain. Y también estamos trabajando para que hacia adelante este, tengamos otro tipo de experiencias que podamos vincular, reconocer aprendizaje obtenido en otros lados eh, y a, acreditar, eh, digamos, uh, estas competencias hacia el posgrado. Eh, otra, otra actividad también que hemos estado haciendo alrededor de esto es eh, reconociendo que en América Latina es la región del mundo con la brecha más grande de talento. ¿no? Eh, creamos un programa eh, que se llama T-Price, es un programa de innovación abierta en conjunto con la Universidad de los Andes en Colombia, en donde eh, cada año lanzamos una competencia para escoger a cinco eh, empresas, startups, eh, organizaciones de la sociedad civil que, tengan, eh, que estén trabajando en la brecha de habilidades para el trabajo, cada año atendiendo a un grupo distinto, digamos, de, de personas en el reto del, eh, que lanzamos cada año, por, como pueden ser eh, mujeres, indígenas, gente en condiciones de, eh, que estuvieron en la cárcel, por ejemplo, grupos generalmente vulnerables, y lo que buscamos son soluciones que ofrezcan eh, eh, un enfoque tecnológico que permita escalar eh, para que estas personas tengan eh, mejores opciones de formación a través de credenciales alternativas. ¿no? De nuevo, es lo que estamos de, justamente de lo que estábamos hablando en este, en este momento. Y, y bien, también eh, estamos hacia el futuro, pues eh, tenemos un, un programa en particular de habilidades digitales eh, que estamos eh, creando dentro del TEC, que va a estar dirigido a públicos muy diversos para eh, buscar eh, estas necesidades de la industria, los negocios y la sociedad, cómo los podemos satisfacer. Y también tenemos una serie de programas en nuestra universidad hermana eh, Tech Milenio, que ha estado haciendo mucho alrededor de esto también, eh, particularmente con temas eh, digitales. Muchas gracias, José. Tengo una pregunta ahora que estamos en confianza y no nos escucha nadie. Eh, ¿Alguna vez hubo un momento de crisis en el TEC ante esta disrupción que estabais viendo? ¿Un punto de inflexión en el que dijisteis o nos transformamos o morimos? Sí, cuando dijiste que no, que no nos oiga nadie, re revisé la pantalla y dije, se cayó el Zoom. No, <risa> eh, eh, no eh, es algo eh, que me han preguntado mucho eh, eh, porque nosotros decidimos cambiar eh, es una decisión que la hicimos, creo, en el mejor momento, cuando nadie está dispuesto a cambiar, generalmente, porque no teníamos un problema financiero, no teníamos un problema de selectividad de alumnos o de alumnos que lleguen a la universidad, no teníamos ningún problema. Simplemente fue una, eh, un trabajo que hicimos internamente con, eh, entre nosotros, con el Instituto del Futuro de la Educación y la Universidad, los miembros de la universidad, que pensábamos hacia dónde debería de ser el futuro de la educación superior y que nosotros no queríamos ser simplemente espectadores de ese futuro o surfear, vamos a decir, la ola, sino que queríamos estar eh, en la ola, ¿no? Queríamos ser parte de la ola. Y creo que todavía estamos a tiempo para que las universidades, los que estamos aquí, eh, startups, empresas, seamos parte de los creadores de ese futuro, ¿no? Entonces, la parte que, que nosotros tuvimos esa firme convicción, eh, se planteó un proyecto con mucho rigor y tu, tenemos un consejo, también es una suerte, que apoyó, no sin cuestionarnos, eh, que apoyó esta, esta transformación eh, en el país de Monterrey, que bueno, para, ha sido muy exitosa, la verdad. Muchísimas gracias, José. And now we're going to um, turn to Maria Spies from Holon IQ. Uh, she is the co-CEO uh, at Holon IQ, and as you all know, uh, is the world leading platform for impact uh, intelligence. Uh, Maria has worked in public uh, and private higher education for over 20 years in the APAC region, specializing in transforming education through technology. And uh, she has also built and led global innovation teams, driving innovation in curriculum teaching and the student experience. Welcome, Maria. So great to have <laughs> you here you. with us. It's uh, great to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, Maria, at Holon IQ, you produce amazing data that describes the trends in supply and demand of the education markets, among other things. Uh, and uh, in our report, we've identified different types of alternative credentials in the market, as uh, Isabel presented, certificates for completing courses of training, certification after taking the exam, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and some of our panelists have also mentioned some other ways of, of, of uh, generating a supply for certificates. Um, among the different alternative potentials, where do you think are the strongest potentials in the market right now, in your opinion, and why? <laughs> Thanks for that question. Yeah, yeah great. Question. That's fine. The strongest credential in the market by far, the strongest credential in the market by far is, is a formal credentials, of course, trillions of dollars in the, in, the, in the traditional sort of sector. Alternative credentials uh, in terms of size of market is much smaller, um, you know, 100 times smaller. But uh, as 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 it's been discussed, that the cost of these things is so much lower. So size of market is an interesting concept because something that there's millions of them and they're very expensive is going to be a big market. <laughs> but actually, you've got lots and lots of people undertaking smaller chunks of learning, paying less. It's a smaller market, but actually, what are you measuring really? Um, in terms of the non-traditional credentials. Um, the ones that are most in demand and the ones that will continue to be most in demand are those which are very, very closely tied to careers and jobs. And careers and jobs change. And that's what's been happening over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And, uh, you know, credentials are trying to catch up here in terms of um, as in the past, say, 50, 60 years ago, um, you know, um, uh, participation in higher education was relatively low. It was elite. I mean, it's still elite, but it's, it was relatively elite and it was designed that way. <laughs> it's an exclusive club, essentially. And governments over the last 50 years have been trying to get every, everyone into higher degrees because it be, brings better outcomes. And then what's happened, of course, is that universities have been the magic wand for everything. And so all types of training was loaded into universities. And so, of course, this is, this is crazy. And now over a period of time, as jobs are changing and they're changing fast, technology is changing and it's changing fast, there is absolutely no way that one vehicle can deliver what's needed. Um, and so I've, I'm, I, I do feel for universities because I think they've, they've been loaded up with everything, lots of high expectations. Um, and, it, and like everybody said, it's not either or, but it is, it's, it's, it's fitness for purpose. And I think that's really important. Universities have an incredibly important role to play and will continue to do so. Fitness for purpose, though, are they the best to deliver outcomes for somebody who wants to be a project manager? Maybe not. Are they the best for learning how to learn, for logical thinking, for creative creativity, you know, that are foundational skills in the world that are super important? Absolutely. And so I think we need to look at fitness for purpose. But in terms of, at the moment, alternative, micro, credentials, um, those which are very closely tied to careers and skills. So I always look to the professional associations. They've got a lot of potential and a lot of power um, because they certify the, the career of, whether it be lawyers or physicians or nurses or accountants or whatever. And what we're seeing is new types of pro professional credentials delivered not by professional associations, but by very large companies. Google is one example of that. They're, an, they're, a, they're a proxy essentially um, for um, uh, you know, a, a, an industry association. And I think we're going to continue to see that evolution as time goes by. But the important thing about micro and alternative credentials is what governments do. And so governments all around the world are starting to say, well, you know what? Um, they're caring, of course, about labour markets and jobs, and they want their people in, in jobs. Um, they want their economies going. And so they are starting to um, uh, recognise micro-credentials, build frameworks around them, embed them into their qualifications frameworks. This is incredibly important because once governments start to recognise, define, recognise um, and embed different types of credential levels into qualifications frameworks, 
then they will start to regulate them. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, but they will, and they'll start to fund them. And all of a sudden, the game has changed for everybody. And so I'd be really watching what governments are doing. We're already seeing qualifications frameworks and micro-credentials being embedded in, in quite a number of countries around the world, and that will continue. And of course, um, you know, this is an ecosystem change, and people have been talking about ecosystem, and it's an ecosystem change. Governments need to be involved in this. Um, and of course, technology, because you need to portability and so on and so on, blockchain and all that comes in. Um, but it, it, in an ongoing way, absolutely needs to continue to be very, very focused on outcomes, which in this case is jobs and skills. Hi, I, yeah, absolutely, Maria. And I think um, one of the points that you've raised now, uh, how education or post-secondary education is transforming uh, from a more kind of boutique education, elite education to a mass uh, education from exclusivity to something that more people can, act, can, act, can, can access. And, and it's not just, it, it doesn't just have to do as you, as you described with the fact that we are becoming more egalitarian or more concerned. Uh, although I, I know that you emphasize the role, the importance of the role of the government that needs to, to do this balancing act, act of, of distribution and redistribution of opportunities. Mm -hmm. But besides that, there is actually a pressing need on the market to have more people with higher level of qualifications. Mm -hmm. There are more sophisticated jobs and, and there is a demand for having not just a portion of the population or the talent, but much more people uh, trained to respond to those, to, to those market needs, which is very interesting because somehow we are, uh, in my view, we are in a process of democratizing the mm -hmm. access to uh, relevant, quality post-secondary education programs in a way and in numbers that we hadn't seen before. Uh, so right. I think I think that is that is a very that is a very interesting uh, trend and I thank you for, for that for sharing with that, that with us that that reflection. I think it's uh it is great. And um and because you emphasize the role of government and now I want to turn to Glenda uh, Quintini. She's a senior economist, as, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the OECD. Uh, she, Glenda oversees the work on skills carried out by the Employment, Labor and Social Affairs Directorate. Glenda leads a team of economists looking at how skill needs are changing in the labor market and identifying effective policy responses in the area in particular to of adult learning and on the job training. And I like that because uh, uh, Jose uh, just mentioned that idea of uh, having a relationship with individuals and the students for 60 years before it would used to be four to five years. Now, now it's a long life uh, journey that uh, training institutes, universities, et cetera, and um, boot camps are, are, are having with, with, uh, with the students. So, Glenda, uh, hello, uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, looking forward to, to hear your thoughts. Uh, hello, Glenda. Hello, yes, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's been a fantastic conversation so far. Lots of very interesting thoughts and conversations. Uh, thank you, Glenda. And um, to your question, um, so one of the issues that we identify in the in the report that we are launching today is that different types of credentials have different quality, and uh, that was one of the points precisely that Maria raised in in her intervention. Uh, and so, um, actually, Maria and Mariana both mentioned that that point, and I think. Um, uh, evidence indicates that industry-wide standardized criteria can be a key factor for the strong market value of alternative credentials. This, you and I have already had this conversation in the past, both in, in private settings and, and in, in also in webinars that you organized at the OECD. I, I know that this is, a, this is an issue that you, you care a lot about. Uh, so how can governments, uh, talking about the role of governments that Maria brought and put in at the center of this conversation, how can governments in Latin America and the Caribbean better help establish industry-wide standards for alternative credentials? 
Yeah, thank you very much. This is a, a very relevant point. I like very much with what Mariana said that not all boot camps are born equal. They often uh, ask us, you know, what's the returns to training? I mean, training is a big word. You know, there's millions of different trainings. Some have a huge returns, and others are really not a, a very good value for money. So I think it's a very, very good question. It, it's new in many countries. So um, I have to say this is a this is a new field uh, internationally. I think, but there are um, initiatives that are coming to pop up in terms of regulating in some ways uh, micro credentials, trying to, uh, or alternative uh, uh, non degree credentials uh, uh, in various uh, uh, places. So, uh, uh, for example, an example that comes to mind is uh, the European Commission, which in December last year came up with a proposal for a council recommendation. So, for those who are not used to European language, a council recommendation is just a recommendation, it's not mandatory, but it is what it says. So recommendations for countries to come up with uh, uh, some sort of framework. So the idea is that this uh, approach that the European Commission is now developing will uh, uh, encourage countries to use, uh, to have a definition and then to use a shared definition of micro-credentials and or alternative credentials. Uh, to use similar standards, to set principles, for example, for the design and for issuing um, the credentials. Uh, there's also a clear reference to an ecosystem. So I think that's very important. Again, we've heard that many times. So, so um, again, uh, mapping the market, uh, so the various stakeholders and ensuring they're collaborating. I think something that's very important uh, um, is, is the element of stackability and portability. And I expect this, for example, in the European context to have to, to be very important. And I think it is important internationally and it's been mentioned in the conversations. Uh, in, in the countries in Europe, there's this idea that adult learning is an upskilling pathway. That's what uh, uh, that's the idea that came up a few years ago, again, from the European Commission. And because it's an upskilling and it's a pathway, people should be able to build on what they learn. So they should be able to stack um, any you know, degree or credential they acquire. They should be able to, to move them. So they should be portable from one institution to the other. So I think these two elements uh, will be important. And I think they'll probably be part of this recommendation to regulate the market uh, um, a, a little bit. Um, I think there's other approaches, for example, I. One of the oldest approaches to, um, again, the government intervention regulation of alternative degree credentials is uh, alternative credentials is in New Zealand. Uh, so they've had uh, this uh, uh, for quite a few, for about a decade now. Um, and uh, uh, that's a little different, for example, because they put employers at the heart. And so even when they allowed higher education institution to provide uh, alternative degrees uh, they mandated that they have to be developed in collaboration with employers so this is a an important element um, and then uh, they establish for example the number of credits or the number of hours um, that uh, uh, the degree should uh, have the the credential should have uh, they set a level so for example in New Zealand it's quite broad it can go from high school level uh, to uh, up to, to university, for example. Uh, and, and then they, they have also set quality assurance. Uh, so there is a quality assurance framework that applies uh, to these credentials and they feed into what is the national qualification framework. So basically they have a place somewhere which is recognized. Because they are uh, really led by the private sector and they're seen as something separate from the main education system, which is different from what, for example, uh, the European Commission is trying to achieve in Europe, and they are not as portable and not as stackable. <laughs> so if you want, they are two uh, kind of slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, models. Um, I think one interesting point I'd like to, uh, to add, maybe two points. One is that the choice of how you um, again, set standards, regulating somehow it depends a lot on the market, how the market looks like. For example, the whole discussion today has uh, 
also, I mean, many people have mentioned the cost. For example, if you take countries like uh, European countries, in reality, the discussion is almost the opposite. Degrees are free. Most people in most European countries, most adults can go back to education, do a degree for free. It will not be very useful to them. I totally agree with you. But the issue is precisely that doing, on the other hand, an alternative credential is expensive. So if you're high skilled, your employer will pay or you have the money to pay because you're in a high wage job. But uh, if you're low skilled, it's very difficult to access these alternative credentials. So I think it's important that whatever um, kind of standards and regulations you put in place, you also pay attention to, um, you know, how the, the formal uh, system looks like. And, and perhaps one, uh, um, one, one last point is, is, I think, and again, this has been said in some ways, I think that the best value, in, in my view, is really in the collaboration between the public and the private sector. So obviously, all the advantages of privately developed either by private training providers or by the private sector uh, are, are more in line with what's needed, immediately usable, very flexible and everything. But again, the element of stackability and portability is important if we are kind of designing pathways for people to, to then grow in, in their life, in their career, whatever point they start from. So I think for that, the public sector does have an advantage. That's what uh, Jose uh, was just saying, right? So being a formal institution allows you to uh, bring in that element of recognition that, that allows you to build, again, this stackability and portability, mm -hmm. which is, I think, very important. Yeah, absolutely, Glenda. And I think I, I just want to highlight uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, portability and stackability are, are key in this process. And as you mentioned, I really like how you um, illustrated that saying, okay, there are different models there, uh, depending on the involvement of the, if it is a private sector led movement, or if it is a government with a private sector uh, movement, and how uh, we have different cases, different different paradigms, so to speak, and, and the, the efforts that New Zealand, for example, or the European Commission are, are leading might be helping in this portability and stackability of, of these alternate, alternate uh, programs. Uh, thank you also for bringing us to, for, for the perspective because the regional perspective, right? Uh, what, what can be a very costly in one region is not necessarily costly. And in the case of the European Union, uh, the, the situation is reversed in terms of cost and therefore access. So it's very, very interesting to see the two, the two different, uh, how the two different regions are behaving and 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 compare that and um, having that in mind. That's that's great. Thank you for for your points. And then of course the role of the government in coalition with uh, or in partnership with the private sector and the role of regulation and quality assurance mechanisms in this process. Thank you so very much uh, to to all of you. Um, for, for being part of this uh, great conversation. Uh, thank you to the audience. I know that we are past the, the time and so we are closing this, this webinar. And, and I just wanna close with a, with a very short reflection. I was actually reading an interview in Fortune to uh, Microsoft's, she's the, uh, Microsoft's chief data scientist, La Vista Ferres, for those of you who know him, uh, which uh, by the way, worked at the IDB, and uh, he said the following, doing complicated and complex things is the easiest way to impress people. But if you really want to have an impact on the world, your solutions need to be simple. Building simple solutions is hard, but it's very powerful. So I just wanna close with this because I was just thinking, okay, it seems that alternative credentials could be precisely one of those simple and powerful solutions today to close the skill gaps, to bring more opportunities to a lot of talent and top talent that we have, particularly in Latin, in the Latin American and Caribbean region and very unequal uh, region in which not everybody has the opportunity to continue through post-secondary education. And so we have a long way ahead of us to make it work uh, effectively. But if we do, as La Vista said, it will be extremely powerful. Thank you all. Uh, and looking forward to continue the conversation offline. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.